Life's a competition. I mean, I'm not the first person to say that, but yeah, for some of us, everything is a competition. And when it comes to broadheads, I've made my choice. I choose a broadhead that creates happiness. How these guys are putting this story together you know, really makes sense, uh, but there's so much work that goes into just a 30 second spot. Use of the bow and arrow dates back to the dawn of time. What was once a means for survival has now become much more for modern man. Technology, innovation, entertainment, and sustenance are all the driving force behind the world of archery today. For millions of hunters and enthusiasts alike, archery is a major part of our lives. People gotta feel that passion when they come in the shop and know that it's really what you love to do. My name is Tim Burnett, and I've been blessed to have a career in the outdoor world for nearly a decade. Making your passion a career is tough, but it can be done. There are many career paths to go down, stories to be told, and journeys to be had. My quest is to showcase some careers in the archery world and to share the lives and lifestyles of a few professionals who have found their way. With every plane that I board and every mile that I drive, it seems like time seems to slow way, way down. It's not that I'm not busy, but I think that I've always had the words of Emerson nagging in the back of my head. Life is a journey, not a destination. This journey takes me to a state that until now, I have only just passed through. Today, I am in Maine and I'm spending time with a professional that I probably have very little in common with. Very little in common, that is, outside of archery. That, and as it turns out, an occasional hankering for a cold rock star. How's it going, Tim? Hey, how's it going? Good to see you, man. Welcome to Maine. Breakfast up. Oh, a little something for me. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Tim, I'm adding on another 1,800 square feet and a trophy room, new great room, two new offices. I'd like to introduce you to David Cousins, world champion archer from Maine. I honestly have no clue what it means to be a professional archer, but from what I hear from the guys that know Dave better than me, it won't take me very long to find out. How do you get anybody to do any construction during deer season? These guys are living under strict, strict rules. There will be no hunting season 2015. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't got, have taken the job. Most people when they add on are just making room for some kids or something. <laughs> no, no kids. Dogs? No, no dogs? No, no. Yeah. My wife has one. Child to raise, that's me. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, she struggled with that. <laughs> well, uh, come on inside, I'll give you a tour. I guess I'm expecting to see a few heads on the wall, a gold buckle or two, and a whole hell of a lot of paper targets with the center punched out. This is my office. This is pretty much where daily operations for me happens. and. A few more of my mounts in here and stuff, and you know some of these they aren't they aren't the biggest trophies in a lot of people's eyes, but to me each and every one of them means something. Like that's the first deer I ever harvested. To one sixty three, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, well, living up here in the northeast in the woods, we're we come from a meat hunting mentality. I mean, you look at that rack, and it's he's not even sixty inches, but it's one hundred and sixty three pounds, and it. it in my mind, when I shot that deer, however old I was, you know, 13, 14 years old, that was the biggest deer I've ever seen. It was a buck. Yeah, you know, it was a buck, exactly. This is pretty much where I keep most of my trophies that mean a little bit more to me, like world championships and gold medals and all that stuff here. I mean, there's over, I think, 17 or 18 world championship wow. titles hanging right here. There's a big accumulation of, yeah. of uh, hard work right there. Yeah. A lot more of it now is strategic, you know, what tournaments do you want me to focus on, you know, from a presence standpoint? Working on with your partners and sponsors. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, where are we weak? Where do we need representation? You know, where are we well? You know, you also figure in, you know, hey, where where do you want to, you know, where's my enthusiasm? Is my enthusiasm on indoors this year? Is it on field archery? Is it on Mark Yardage 3D? What, you know, is it on European, on the European tour? Is it on the US tour? So a lot of those things get factored into play. And there are a lot of players at the table that make those decisions. So it's not just, you know, yeah, I'm going to go to this, 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 and this, and this now. And now I'm up to as many as 24 events in one season. It really adds up. You'll see on that calendar, there's some in there where you literally go from one to the next to the next to the next, and you don't return home. Like uh, my latest tour coming up, I'll leave the day before Thanksgiving, and I won't be back until December 15th. 
Now my curiosity is piqued. This guy really does eat and breathe this stuff. I know that there are some of you guys sitting at home on your couch thinking to yourselves, I want to be a professional archer. Well, from what I'm seeing here, if you want to step up and compete for wins and the ever rare sponsor's dime, then you'd better get up off the couch and start practicing because this guy is showing no signs of ever letting up. Dude, yeah, that one's pretty early, huh? Yeah, that's actually so three that's generations. That's me, my grandfather, and my dad. How old were you there? Still got a little uh, teenage shooting a brown, and so I, I couldn't have been like 16, 17. Wow, yeah, I'm pretty young. That world record right there is the that's the first world record I ever shot. Now, a world record in archery, what is, what does that mean? Like, well, what that was at the time, um, right there, that was in January of 1999. So that was 16 years ago. And that's a 18 meter, so 20 yard into a world record. You can see the inner 10 in there. It's about the size of your thumbnail. Um, I shot a 598 out of five out of uh, out of 600 on that, which means I hit that inner 10 ring 58 out of 60 times, and that was a new world record. And that record stood for. It just fell two years ago. Perfect score. Yeah. yeah. So it was the longest standing uh, world record in, in world archery history. Really? Yeah. Let's head downstairs to the shop, which is more there. resembles a dungeon right now because of the construction. But after the break, Dave gives advice to aspiring archers. You've got to go out there in the field and execute. We learn what all his secrets are. This is my opportunity to punch my ticket to the dance. And Team Prime shoots their way to the podium at Red Bull. Why did you miss? Was it you or was it your bow? Maybe it's time for a change. Step up to the Prime Performance Zone, an advanced accuracy system of superior strength, balance, and control. It's the most advanced and most accurate system ever made. The Prime Performance Zone compensates for less than perfect conditions, giving you accuracy in the field when you need it most. So was it you that missed? I'm betting it was your bow. There's some youth, youth male freestyle trophies up here. I was gonna say, when you were 12, you must've went to every tournament Everyone I could find, yeah. I mean, th like I said, I apologize for the construction. This is a mess. Well, here's one. Uh, 1995 Maine State Indoor Championships. Youth release. First place. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, any trophy I can get. I didn't stand a chance. <laughs> Honestly, what I've seen so far kind of blows my mind. How is it even possible to have accumulated so much? And what advice would he have for an aspiring shooter? For a younger kid looking at this, you know, it's overwhelming to see all the achievements that you've got. I think it's actually more inspiration. A lifetime of just working your brain out. Of having a, nothing else but this. This is your passion, your one, your one thing. When you got into it, did you have mentors? Did you have like guys that you're like, I'm gonna be, you know, well, that no, guy. Not, I mean, kind of a little bit. I had a lot of, you know, a lot of influences that I that I kind of looked up to for their technique. You know, for how they handle themselves on the line, for how they got that arrow from point A to point B. So, would you consider yourself kind of a mentor to guys like Paul and, and those? I mean, do they do they look at you? You think in, in that regard? Or I try to just lend all my expertise to them I can. You know, uh, it's like the same old thing. You look, well, I don't want those guys to make the same mistakes I did. No, I want them to make some mistakes. You got to learn from them. But it's like I can help you navigate through this a lot more efficiently. If somebody asks, I'm, I'm usually the first guy to volunteer, you know, information on how to help you out. And that's, you know, beyond just the stuff with the rest of our team, you know, tournaments and whatnot. And I mean, to me, <laughs> there's no secrets in the game we play. Even if I share you all that information with you and I mentor you on it, when it comes time for the rubber to meet the road, you've got to go out there in the field and execute it. So now that I've met a guy that for his entire adult life has made a successful living shooting only a stick and string, I have more questions. How is this even possible? What if I wanted to get into competitive archery? And what advice could I have for a young aspiring shooter trying to find his way? Ten years in cynical distance, devils in the mundane details. I 
guess I would have to say, start now. Read all you can read, hold on to every bit of advice you can get, and intently watch every move of those who are currently the most successful. Yesterday was a uh, we started off a little bit slow uh, for me. I dropped one real early. Second target is a 50 yarder. Just nothing technical. Just one of those shots. Just really hadn't worked the bugs out. Not maybe holding and shooting as smooth as I was last week. But, uh, then second target was a big one. Third target, 77 yarder. Yep. And we both got that one. Um, but uh, there was one I mentioned it to you yesterday. There was one going to target out there that was going to be pivotal, was going to be crucial. Yeah. And it's not a very long target. It's a little bit of a technical target, but it just kind of comes at the time of the day that can catch you off guard. It's a 63 yard caribou. It's not very far, 63 yards. We took a hit on that one. Yeah, today we got to go out there. We have the last 20 targets. It's definitely important. We're on a stretch of the course right now that's not super technical, but it is fairly open. So you're going to have to make number one good wind reads, you're going to have to be patient and you're gonna to have to shoot good shots when you have the opportunity to. I mean, both of us are in a position to, I mean, maybe not, we'd have to have some, some real fortune to end up walking away with this thing with a one-two, but we could be in a position to be in a shoot-off for that opportunity. So you've gotta go out there and every moment you're at the stake with an arrow on your bow, you've gotta go into, this is my opportunity to punch my ticket to the dance. I've learned about professional archery, what I've already come to know about any other career that evolves from a passion. It's capitalizing on the competitive drive within us, that innate drive for something more. I was lucky enough to see this passion in thousands of other shooters at a 3D tournament in Reading. And on the last day of the shoot, Dave and fellow team member Paul Tedford were looking to take it all. Yep, yep. middle buddy. Good job, buddy. Yeah, somewhere in a second. You're tied for a second. When we come back, we see if Dave was able to take his place on the podium. I dig deeper into the highs and lows of his profession, and Dave takes us through his daily practice routine. And there's the easy thing. Stay in there. That's the hard part. <laughs> From my experience as a bow hunter, it's easy to fear those things that you can't control. Once that arrow leaves your bow, the burden's not on you anymore. You have to trust in the performance of your broadhead. And when it comes to broadheads, I've made my choice. I choose a broadhead that creates havoc. The choice is simple. The all new Havoc broadhead, the Terra of Two from G5. Choose wisely. Optimizing the bow for how you're performing at the moment until you get back to peak, and that's kind of where I am. So yesterday it felt like one of two things, either overall bow draw length was a little off or loop length was a little off, but I really feel it was a length related issue because I just couldn't, I just couldn't get full extension and expansion in my front half or in my back half. Sure, I was steady, sure shots are breaking okay, but they were a little random. So, you know, first thing I want to do before I head for range 
in a time like that as long as we get drawing. I'm not too concerned about holding weight and stuff, but well, I've got it on the bench, we'll look at timing and all that stuff. It's just, you know, just like one of the regular routine maintenance things. Mm -hmm. Where are you putting your ruler in relationship to, sure. this, to the start point yep. versus, so that, so that if someone has this or a mm -hmm. hooter shooter or whatever, they're measuring their draw. Yep. AMO standard for measuring drawing is from the throat of the grip of the bow to the string plus an inch and three quarters. So the throat of the grip of the bow goes right up against this post. Is what that post. So, you know, what we've done right there is just offset that. So you're right at your inch and three quarters. So that's where the throat of the grip stops. So now we can read this ruler at its face value. See what I mean? So it's not like the ruler doesn't start at the front of this post. It's the throat plus inch and inch and three quarters, quarters. exactly. So. so this here is to maintain just keep it from the tiller. Square. Yeah, yeah, and that's why there's several holes in Could the. Could you bench. square that off anywhere too, or well, what you can do is you can look oh, at that. Oh, depending on the riser, you can actually look at the string, you know, on the ruler and line it up but to keep the riser and string path perpendicular to the ruler, the, the line the right. you're pulling it on so. without it being turned or anything. Exactly. I know what some of you must be thinking at home. What does a guy who plays a game for a living do to keep himself busy? What does his workday look like? And what does he do to make himself so consistent at winning? Well, from what I'm seeing, nothing out of the ordinary that you or I wouldn't be doing. The mornings are filled with office duties and phone calls, maybe a little workout, and then head to the local archery shop and fling a couple hundred arrows at 20 yards, over and over at 20 yards. If there's one thing that I've learned about being very good at anything, it mostly comes down to consistency and repetition. If you do the same things the right way over and over and over, then every move becomes natural. Uh, pretty much smoke. In 15 arrows, head to head against another man, you need to shoot a 150 or 149 to still be in it to have a chance. And a 150 or 149 may only get you one arrow close to center to see who moves on and who stays home. Yeah. Geez. You know? And then you go home on the plane because you missed it by. Yeah, but you know, you were in that moment, you got what you came for. Yeah. You know, I'm there for the ride. I'm there for the chance to put myself in that position and experience it. That's the thrill of it. I mean, all time, lifetime, you're gonna lose way more than you're ever gonna win. But the ones you do win, pretty sweet. And the ones you lose, you learn something from. And you gotta look back, it's like, man, I had a good ride up until that point. When we come back, we learn what Dave really thinks about competition. Life is a competition. I teach him how to catch a bass. Okay, so that was first. And we sit down and talk about the highs and the lows of becoming a professional archer. 20 seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, nine. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off. Houston, I have a visual. The C Max has landed. The all new G5 C Max drop away RRS. Launch into your dealer today. job is to win world championships and break world records get excited about making a state fishing team but you know, made the state team the last three years in a row been to uh, the divisionals twice just missed going to the nationals so maybe third time's a charm some guys get excited about big bucks and I get excited about that you know life is a competition you know you never stop competing 
Now, fishing for me is, it's my release. It's where I go to find my solitude, where I go to think. You know, a lot of, a lot of ideas and things I have, you know, that come to me about product design and development, about how I'm gonna train and approach for tournaments and stuff, and, and how I'm gonna manage the next direction, the next move I'm gonna make business on. A lot of them have come yeah. right here on the front deck of this boat. Didn't think we'd be going fishing this week. Did you think you'd be fishing? No. I'm gonna let you play guide, so. Now that blade like that, you just wanna keep it going like this, just gonna, just keep you wanna feel that, yeah, keep a tight line on it, and you'll feel it, feel it, a lot of vibration. That's what you want. I've been a full-time professional archer since 1995 right from you know really young kid all the way up through my teen years and it stemmed from a desire to always want to compete you know in individual sports and, and always love the outdoors and the, the, the idea the thought of becoming a full-time professional archer never really dawned on me until I was already quite a few years into being an archery enthusiast it was already a facet of my life it was something I did for recreation it was something I did you know to hunt it was already part of you know this environment that I grew up in in the outdoors up here in Maine there we go, dude. Yeah, um, you know, the highs of the highs are, you know, those days where you go out and before you ever go to a tournament, you know you're gonna win. Just because of how your training has gone, how your mental preparation has gone, how your physical preparation has gone, and just when you step out there on the field, the level of ease and calm that you have to just stand there and the whole process just happens so organically. Every time that's ever happened, those are the best of the best days. Whether you come home with a gold medal or not. Okay, so that was first. First, oh shoot. <laughs> Throughout this project, I really feel grateful to learn so many things about the various careers in the archery and hunting industry. And every interview, I try to remember to ask a few but basic key questions. I try to ask, do you ever wish that you had done something different? Looking back, would you change anything? And what other advice could you give? Yeah, and there were times over the years, you know, coming up and developing my craft and, and my marketability and those other off the field skills that I thought, you know, geez, maybe. Maybe we should have done something else. You know, this is not all just, you know, go practice and shoot your arrows, go to the tournament, collect a check and a trophy. I wish it was. I really, literally wish it was that simple. But just like anything else, it is a job. It has its highs and it has its lowest of lows. And there's a whole lot of in the middle. Looking back on days like this, I reflect and say, you know, this is awesome. It's the best job ever, you know. I've been doing this full time for 20 years. That's 50% of my adult life, a little more than 50% of my adult life. That's, that's all I've ever done. Fantastic. I don't look back and say, man, I wish I'd have done something else for the last 20 years. Oh, heck no, even on its worst days. Hope you got what you need, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>